evening, everyone. Welcome to The Dwelling Place. This is Evangelist Doris J. Roberson, your host. At this time, I'm going to offer a word of prayer, and shortly thereafter, I will be introducing our guests. And while we are preparing, I would love for you to invite others to come on and listen to this amazing journey. Uh, at this time, let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for allowing us to come together. Thank you, Lord, for this viewing audience and those that have supported throughout these last two plus years. We thank you, Lord, for all of our featured guests throughout this month. We thank you, Lord, for these wonderful women of God that are trailblazers doing uh, the work that you have assigned unto them in this season. We ask your blessings now as we go forth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We want to thank you, as I said once again, for being with us throughout the month of March. Well, the month of March is known for international women in history as well as women history all across the world. I want to uh, say that it's been a blessed month. God truly blessed us and uh, our featured guests have ministered, truly have ministered to people across this country. I've received uh, outstanding uh, comments about every one of our speakers for the month of March. I commend our speakers for all of their accomplishments and what they're doing in the body of Christ. While we're preparing for our speaker on tonight, I want you to tag someone, someone that is listening on YouTube. You can also share we want those that are on Facebook to share. There may be some young person that is aspiring to become a dentist or either a physician in the medical field. You will hear this amazing woman uh, and how she is blazing the trail. Uh, our theme tonight for this presentation is the trailblazer who paved the path and the one who's blazing are today. And so with that, let me go ahead and again, invite you to invite others to listen in. As I'm preparing to introduce our, our guests, uh, I want you to know that I'm delighted and humbled by each one of our guests that have been on our broadcast this month. Women are amazing. And I know that God has allowed us to be able to be a blessing to the kingdom of God. Women are the pillars of homes and businesses and uh, so much in the marketplace. It is the women that get many times that get the job done. I'm not discrediting the value and the worth of men, but where there is a strong, intelligent uh, woman, uh, I tell you, God has blessed these women and they're impacting the country. With that said, let me share with you information about our guest on tonight. Doctor, uh, just one second, I'm getting my notes here and I want to be able to bring it up and do this uh, in a professional way. Dr. Kalanya Calhoun is the 2023 recipient of the distinguished faculty Dr. Ida Gray Faculty Diversity Award. She serves as the president and CEO of in integrative solutions, and she's also an adjunct associate clinical professor at the University of Michigan School of Dentistry. She has studied oral and maxillary facial surgery. She's also have co-authored a physician guide to oral health, 
She has blazed the trail mentoring, coaching, and receiving many distinguished awards, too many to mention. She is a resident of the state of Michigan, and we thank God that she is a woman of God that loves God as well as a worshiper. You can find her uh, out on social media, got a beautiful voice and uses her talents to be a blessing to the kingdom of God and also uh, to students all over, literally all over the US. I want to start by asking Dr. Calhoun, tell us a little bit about Dr. Ida Gray, who paved the path for all of those that have come after her. And as you share, we want to also hear your journey, uh, a little bit about the mentors that have uh, mentored you and any advice that you want to share uh, to those that may be interested in the field of dentistry. And of course, I did not do your bio justice. So share with our audience tonight, many of your accomplishment and what God has put in your heart to share tonight. Just talk to us. And we want our audience to ask questions, put it in the chat, and she will address those questions at the end of our conversation. Thank you, Dr. Kalanya Calhoun. And I want to say congratulations. We are honored to have you as our featured guest in as a trailblazer in science. And we have a very nice memento that we are sending to all of our guests and you will receive that at the toward the end of this month. With that stated, welcome to the dwelling place. Are you muted? Let's see. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you, Evangelist. Um, I am honored uh, to be asked to uh, speak today as I was honored for receiving this award. Um, the, the award is uh, regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion, and basically having a focus on uh, doing that throughout your career. And so it was really a blessing because I didn't do it to be, I didn't do those things to be seen. And somebody was, you know, there that, you know, watched my uh, interactions. And so I'm just really appreciative of that. Now, Dr. Gray um, had a similar um, uh, vision in her life, even though it wasn't necessarily seen early in her um, childhood. Uh, she was uh, also known as Dr. Ida Gray Nelson as well as Ida Rollins. She was born in 1867 to a black teenage mother and a white father. Wow. Uh, she was raised by her aunt when her mother passed away. And, but at a young age, she demonstrated a great work ethic. Uh, while persevering in school, she worked even as a seamstress. Now, Dr. Gray became interested in dentistry when she was working in the office of doctors William and Jonathan Taft, who were advocates for training female dentists and uh, when Jonathan uh, Taft left, um, left his practice and was recruited to help found the University, University of Michigan's first uh, school of dentistry, uh, Ida continued to work with his brother brothers in his brother's office while preparing for the entrance exam for the School of Dentistry at U of M. So after she passed the exam, she began dental school in October of 1887 and graduated June of 19 of 1890, becoming the first African American woman dentist in the United States. What a remarkable um, uh, career in such a short period of time, where she was able to um, to get past the loss of her mother, the uninvolved, the non-involvement of her father to be able to um, uh, take on mentorship from even people that didn't look like her because both doctors Taft were not African-American, but they saw potential in her. 
Mm -hmm. Now, one of the remarkable things about Dr. Gray was that she served both white and black patients in both Cincinnati and eventually in her practice in Chicago. And that is not something you would expect to see in the late 1800s when there was so much, um, I mean, there was segregation and slavery was just abolished, you know, 30 plus years ago. So it wasn't like that was a time where everything was integrated, but she had white and black patients that would come see her. Um, even in the black media, she was repeatedly cited as a role model for other women. And she had a reputation for her gentleness, especially with children. So that's probably why she drew uh, a lot of patience. And I think that's a trait that um, we realize as a profession is important to have so that the patients get a well-rounded experience as well as educators being diverse so that even um, uh, those that don't have those gifts can have those modeled before them. And so I think it is so awesome that um, that is recognized as a, a, a positive trait for women that are in dentistry. Now, her influence even inspired one of her own patients, Olive M. Henderson, to follow in her footsteps and pursue a career in dentistry. And she became, became the second Black female dentist in the city of Chicago. Hmm. Now, in addition to her practice of dentistry, Dr. Gray served as vice president of the Professional Women's Club of Chicago. So she was involved in, in social events and uh, as well as the 8th Regiment late the eighth regiment ladies auxiliary and their focus was in keeping this black um, um shelter open for underserved uh or, or women that were in trouble um now dr gray also leaves a legacy at our alma mater as you've already mentioned um with where the school of dentistry at u of m uh, has an annual diversity award that is given in her name and they've been given that award i think since uh 2000 and so um, when I found that out, when I came back uh, from California, it was nice to see because I used to hear about her. We had a picture of her, but U of M's focus has always been in having diversity, equity, and inclusion so that our patients get the best care um, because, you know, God made us different for a reason for us to have different traits, different experiences, and all that makes us better as, um, as caregivers and, um, and as ed educators. Now, although there has not been any comprehensive uh, biography done on Dr. Gray, uh, Nelson Rollins, she's often cited in works as an example of achievement and an inspiration for others to follow. And even her gravestone reads, Dr. Ida Gray Nelson Rollins, first Negro woman dentist in America. And that to me is um, remarkable. And I, I was actually reading a, uh, a book that my colleague, Dr. Marilyn Woolfolk, and I, I don't know her co-author is off the top of my head, um, talking about women in, uh, in the field of medicine and trailblazers. And um, uh, I, when I was reading through the book, I was like, well, I wonder if I was a first for anything. And I found out that I was actually the first uh, Black female oral surgeon that um, uh, obtained a wow. PhD. And, you know, wow. I used to be told that. Thank you. Thank you. It's not in any book or anything yet, but, you know, it feels good to be a first, but it honestly feels good when there's not a difference and that you don't have, there's no more first after that. We can have many people that feel like they can pursue that and they don't feel, they won't have to feel like they can't have a family or accomplish these things without, um, you know, um, obstacles. And so, um, like I said, it, it was a, it was nice to know that, that I at least been able to trailblaze in that regard. Now, my, um, the person that nominated me, um, is our office manager and she's not really involved in the education of residents, but I thank God that my light has shined with her and she's actually a Christian too. And so we share a lot. And so she's the one that nominated me and her reason for nominating me was because, um, of my mental, my mentoring and my commitment to diversity, as well as what she says, my super caring approach with patients and their families. And um, although a surgeon, typical oral surgeon, which is what my profession is, is not typically seen as a gentle person, um, I'm so glad that I have that reputation where uh, patients are like, and even residents and students are like, you're not mean like the other surgeons <laughs> because we can kind of be intense. And I won't say when I was a resident, I was intense as well. But my really my relationship with the Lord grew so much 
um, when I was uh, matriculating through residency and especially when I became faculty and um, progressed to be the program director of our uh, institution at um, in Torrance, California, and then eventually department chair. And I really learned how to let my light shine in those positions. And I remember one of the dental assistants said to me that, you know, I really see God using you um, as a, a department chair. And I was surprised because most of the time de uh, dental assistants don't necessarily like their chairmen if they are like their direct uh, uh, supervisors. So because we usually have rules that they may not want to follow or whatever the case is. But I've always had great relationships with them. And um, that was the other thing that the uh, the office manager mentioned is that I not only mentor students and of our residents, but also the dental assistants. And so a lot of them will ask me questions and I have encouraged them to pursue other careers. I've got one that um, uh, she's uh, going into, two of them that are going to nursing school and, uh, and one is going to a hygiene school. And um, I think that has been the blessing for me because there's a, a saying called see one, do one, teach one in surgery. Yes. And um, I think even with mentorship, you receive mentorship. And one of my first mentors was my mother and telling me that I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Um, but also then you exercise that same level of mentorship to others. And the mentorship doesn't have to be from an older person to a younger person, even people that are younger than you can teach you things. And so always having a teachable heart. Um, and that's kind of what pivoted me to change my direction is in regards to my career. I always thought um, that, well, this is kind of morbid, but I said I would die with the scalpel in my hand because I love operating. I mean, I like removing the large tumors and stuff like that. And um, I would operate all night with the residents and they would have so much fun with me because I basically actually taught them well enough that they could do the procedure by themselves and I could suction and, and, and talk. Um, so um, one of my residents asked me and he's a, he owns a business um, that we're doing some research at U of M uh, in the near future. And um, he asked me, what was next for me? And I was like, what do you mean what is next for me? And I'm so glad that even though he was a second year resident and I had been out for more than 10 years, but I'm listening to this young kid that sees something in me that I didn't see. And so now in this season of my life, I'm focusing on uh, what kind of legacy I can leave on a broader scale. Some of that was coming to the School of Dentistry because teaching residents, you're teaching um, maybe eight uh, people a year maybe up to 14 people a year. But teaching dental students, you're teaching at least 100, 100 dental students each year. You're getting a chance to interact with a lot more. So that was one of my first steps to try to increase my, um, um, my influence because there are some things that I've been, I've been uh, passionate about since I became department chair because I had to deal with not only oil surgery, but all the specialties within dentistry, whether it's endodontics or pedodontics or um, periodontics. And so now um, I've pivoted and ac uh, actually started my business, which you can see here that I'm the uh, president and CEO of Integrative Dentistry Solutions. And this firm is a consulting firm and the purpose is to integrate all oral health into our overall healthcare system there have definitely been strides um, that my colleagues and i have made including proving improving access to care for the underserved populations that are receiving um uh, uh, uh health care um federal health care and so there have been where you have the dental supplements and things like that but a lot of our uh, diseases that I talked about in um, our last episode that I was presenting in, that um, your gingival health or your periodontal health affects almost every organ in the body. And even though I'm not a periodontist specialist, because of me being an old surgeon, I have more interactions with physicians in the hospital. So I've been focusing on, um, on that aspect so that I can uh, then send people out, which I have one of my colleagues who's a periodontist that is working with UCLA School of Medicine to start teaching a class based on our, our textbook that we're coming out, which is, um, what is the name of my text? A Physician's Guide to um, Oral Health, because it covers 
um, about 19 different general areas of your body, whether it's your valves of your heart or your vessels or your um, reproductive um, um, systems, so many areas that your oral health has an impact. And so for me, even though oral surgeons are seen as tooth extractors or tooth pullers, I want people to keep what God gave them if we can, um, because you do have better outcomes. And so I retired from my position as a department chair and moved into this part-time position at U of M as well as started this uh, firm. And not only do we consult, but we, um, we, um, we coach uh, students, executives, different people that would want to that are uh, have different interests in the healthcare system. And like again, the focus is that oral health is a part of overall health. And my goal is that every major hospital has a dental department that doesn't just include oral surgery, but it has a general dentist and a periodontist, and potentially every academic center having a periodontist on staff. And so part of that is why I'm writing the textbooks and um, I will soon be working with the University of Michigan School of Medicine to start integrating that uh, curriculum in that school. So in, in this school. So um, that is pretty much all I have uh, to share, but I would be glad to take any questions. So why are you so passionate about or uh, the, the feel in itself? What just drew you to dentistry overall, uh, Dr. Calhoun? So it's a funny story. When I was in fourth grade, I decided I wanted to be a dentist. I enjoyed going to the dentist. Actually, my brother and I both did. We would try to eat a lot of candy, so we would get a lot of fillings. <laughs> and we just enjoyed the experience. Um, the dentist was super nice, and he was very good. His name was Dr. Carey. Um, and he uh, was very gentle and we had a good experience. We didn't, I don't think, at least going to him, every time we went, it was a good experience. We didn't cry. And so I feel sorry for patients that we get that are definitely afraid of the dentist because we need more dentists like him. And that's why I wanted to be like him. And so I actually used to practice dentistry on my uh, cousins and my brother in our bathroom with the chair reclined, um, a razor blade or... Uh, some <laughs> um, simulation of nitrous, uh, either fingernail polish. I, I'm surprised we didn't hurt each other because I was adamant about becoming a dentist. And that almost changed when I uh, started as an inpatient unit clerk at the University of Michigan Hospital um, when I was an undergrad. And I really enjoyed that high intense um, setting where uh, you have emergencies and that you, you can be the one that saves the patient. And I thought, well, maybe I should go into medicine. And that's why I chose oral surgery after that, because I, or other, um, before that time, my plan was to open dental clinics because I loved the idea of just fixing your teeth. But I also liked being the one that you call when you can't call anyone else. And so I, that's why I ended up training at a level one trauma center in Los Angeles, California, um, at the, which uh, used to be called Martin Luther King Hospital and is now being sponsored by Harvard UCLA. And that's where I also was faculty. And getting those opportunities gets you a chance to see people that probably would not see a dentist unless there was an emergency. Uh, wow. and give them a different experience so that uh, they would come again. And so a lot of patients um, throughout my career, thankfully, um, I had a lot of patients, you know, say, why do you have to leave? <laughs> but they knew how much I loved it. And I think that when you have a passion for something, you can have such a bigger impact. And, you know, I wouldn't have chose, uh, I didn't choose a job for the money. And that's why I don't mind retiring early. Um, and the reason I say that is because a lot of people, and I've had students that choose choose these jobs for the money instead of choosing it for the passion, and you don't have as uh, great of an impact when you do that, is in my humble opinion. So, the student asked you, "What's next?" So now that you are president and CEO of your own consulting firm, is there a next? Next, there is a next, and so. Um, there are several parts to this next. Again, um, uh, one, one component is uh, 
working with hospitals that are interested in integrating oral health, um, doing presentations, which I'm doing even uh, one uh, at, at U of M uh, in April. I was trying to look out oh, April 21st and 22nd. We have a women in oral maxillofacial surgery and I'm presenting there. But the idea is to give them an understanding. And I think physicians really want to know. And since there's a larger volume of physicians um, and, and, and the medical students, they can have even a greater impact if we're all on the same page. And so part of that will be lecturing at the dental schools, as I mean, the, the medical schools and working with uh, the residency training programs for periodontists because periodontal um, residency is mainly focused right now on um, implants. And the idea really is that we should try to retain teeth instead of taking out teeth and putting in something that actually is harder to take care of. And so if we can, we want the residents in periodontics, uh, periodontal residents to train at a hospital setting so that they can do more of the other surgeries to save teeth and improve health outcomes in, uh, the, like I said, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cerebral vascular disease, um, premature birth, and so on. And so that is a big part of it. But the other large part of it, which I didn't realize, was writing and um, getting literature out to the physicians that seen from a, 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 a dentist approach. Mm. And I like and the ironic thing is, again, I, it, I laugh, why did I do oral surgery? Because it seems like I'm becoming the expert in periodontist and they do a lot of research, but I think connecting them with the medical community. And I have, like I said, other colleagues, one at uh, Penn on Lee, um, who's a chairman at uh, Penn's, uh, University of Pennsylvania's uh, oral surgery program and other colleagues that we are working at different arms um, to affect this because the whole idea is to improve access to care. And yes. uh, that is a large part. And then my other next is doing some more music um, and ministry. Uh, I, I actually teach um, praise and worship uh, leadership uh, on uh, Saturdays um, so that, you know, just to improve uh, uh, new leaders and being able to minister and, you know, learning how to flow and all that stuff. And so I'm, you know, I try to be well-rounded. Plus I, sometimes I would ask the Lord, why would you give me so many talents? Cause I can't, I don't have time to do them all. And I realized <laughs> that he gives you seasons. Cause I mean, I paint, I play the piano. Well, I used to play the piano. I'm not that good now. <laughs> um, and I'm like, I, I can't do everything. And, but I've, I'm so blessed now that I'm able to, and you know, with my taking care of my mother, um, and that's why I said I'm so fortunate that I was able to retire early because I've I only um, worked uh, for like 15 years um, out after residency, and I was able to retire um, and you know move back home and take care of mom. But it gets me gives me a chance to mentor um, and also to uh, pursue some of those other things, like I said, in ministry. Wow, I, my hats are off to you. As I reflect on some of the things you said about Dr. Ida Gray coming, uh, growing up as an orphan, mother died early, father was not in her life, and um, it had some other kinds of tragedies and things like that. And uh, someone recognizing that she was gifted. And mm -hmm. so as we think about mentoring, what are some of the things that you can hear resounding in your mind that mentors said to you that keeps you going or keep you um, grounded and directed? So can you share that? Because obviously when I think about a person in 18, the late 1860s, 1870s, uh, man, and, and the struggles that she yeah. must have had to go through sure. and to exactly. move from her home of Clarksville, uh, mm -hmm. I believe it was Tennessee, and then mm -hmm. to come to another state, Ohio, yeah. I believe. Yeah. I mean, and we were slavery and all of that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And overcoming and being in a medical field in the United States and at U of M, I don't believe there was a lot of diversity. No, no, and, no. And probably men, 
Yeah, I'm mostly. sure she had to feel like uh, I don't, I can't pair up with anyone in the class. Mm -hmm, Sometimes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I remember in graduate school feeling like nobody wanted to pair with me, and that mm. hasn't been so long ago. Right, right, right. Talk about That's your it. experience with mentoring and how that has shaped you and how that keeps you grounded. So um, again, I, I mentioned um, that my uh, mentoring can come in different ways. Uh, I mentioned the resident that was a Caucasian male that saw me studying um, dental anatomy when I was a third year undergrad, but because I wanted to be prepared because I was honestly afraid. I wasn't like um, uh, gifted in the sense of um, academics. I just worked hard to learn. I studied eight hours a day as a high school student because, and I, and, and in high school, I mean, actually throughout my life, it took me a lot longer to get information as far as time and, and spent, but retaining it, I find out now and I, I know so much and I'm like, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I haven't studied in a long time, but as I was saying that, um, this, uh, third year resident, for all surgery, saw me studying as a clerk at night after I completed all my work. So I was a good, <laughs> yeah. good worker. I wasn't trying to, you know, but when I had a break, I was reading and he, you know, uh, asked me that I have an interest in dentistry. And I told him I do, but I don't know if I want to go to medical school instead. I didn't know there was anything. I, I, I didn't know any oral surgeons at that time. And he says, well, if you want a family, oral surgery might be the way for you to integrate dentistry with medicine. I mean, yeah, with medicine. And it was uh, like a light bulb went off that this was something I could do and I could stay with what I loved all of my life. And I never thought about it until I got older that that made an impact. Um, I would like to share another story. And sure. the main reason is that sometimes people have a difficult time accepting uh, mentorship when it doesn't when it's there's no positive beginning and positive ending with a little correction in the middle. I had an experience with a faculty member when I was an intern at the University of Maryland, Dr. Bob Ord. Um, he doesn't even remember the story, but of what happened. But he asked me a question on rounds and I had gotten a reputation, didn't know I did, of saying, I don't know. And I was told by someone, if you don't know the answer, don't try to make up something. So that's why I just said, I don't know, because I didn't have any books. I didn't have any money to buy any books. And we didn't really have a good library either. I said, I don't know to a question that I probably was justified in not knowing. But he told me, CC, you do not deserve to be an old surgeon. Mm. You say no every single time you ask a question, you don't even try. First of all, I don't know what all he said because I was crying by then. And there was like 10 other people that were rounding with us all different levels. And it's like this wave, the resident wave where they go on one side and the one person's being asked the questions is on, you know, facing them. And it's almost like they're all against you because they don't want to be near you. And he, I mean, it seemed like uh, at least 10 minutes of telling me why I don't, I shouldn't be an oral surgeon. And I, at that time I was like, okay, well, I don't know if that's the case because unless I change my mind, I'm still going to do it. But then he said, so again, give me an answer. So I gave him one answer that was correct. He said another, and I must've went to through 12 is basically complications of a frontal bone fracture. And I went through 12 of those. He wouldn't let me stop. And then I realized even though he made me upset and he was mean to me in my eyes, apparently he must have saw something because he made me answer those questions and made me realize and believe in myself. And so I would say um, don't despise um, uh, tough counsel because even the Lord had to tell Job off. You know, I would have thought the Lord would be like, well, you know, Job, you going through a little bit and I'm there for you. No, he was like, hey, excuse me. I'm the one that created the stars and the, you know, you can, so I, I think sometimes we can be too sensitive to tough um, counsel, at least be introspective enough to evaluate yourself before. And because I've had people that have been, you know, outright racist and that uh, even at U of M and, and I loved my time here at U of M, but when someone tries to push you, even if they're a little tough, and I learned that when I was in residency at another surgeon that mentored me, 
And oh my God, he was just horrible to everybody. He would always yell and always scream and, and throw instruments and all kinds of stuff. And um, he did that to me. My blood pressure was always high, but I got to do almost all the surgery every single time. And so I've made up in my mind that you can call me anything, just call me to the OR. And so in my mind, if he's letting me do it and I'm learning and others that he's nice to may not get to do as much, then, you know, that may be presentation. And no, it doesn't feel good. I mean, he didn't call me any names, but he was just, you know, me. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but he was, he let me, he taught me so much and he made me do a part of the surgery that no one ever expected me to do and he says i'm not telling cc how to do anything she's going to do this whole side without my instruction wow. and i was crying the whole time i was doing the surgeries to the joint tmj because i did not like tmj surgery and i was like oh no and i and it's because it's tedious and there are vessels that go to the brain that you can stroke out there are um uh, nerves that give you an in, uh, innervation to your face so i i was like i don't really want to do that <laughs> but he wow. i mean i went through the whole surgery because of his mentorship so i'd like to give the tough ones because the other ones are easy to receive when somebody says oh you can do it <laughs> exactly that's powerful so don't be afraid to uh, take the chastisement, the yes. correctiveness, uh, oh, yes. it, because it it's going to grow you and stretch you, and mm -hmm. you learn from it, and it toughen you up, and yeah. you proved uh, that I'm not quitting. And I imagine Dr. Ida Gray experienced every oh, yes. of what you have explained. Thank you for oh, sharing yes. those dynamic stories and yeah. and what's nice is that you also mentioned Dr. Gray was a mentor to the second African American uh female dentist. Mm -hmm. female dentist in in Chicago yes wow so the power of mentorship is Absolutely. so powerful and um even the fact that whoever on her gravestone it is mm -hmm. stated, mm -hmm. first African-American, she wrote her legacy. What, it doesn't matter, I say this and I really do mean it, it doesn't matter where you start. Right. But it right. does matter where you are. And yep. I applaud you, Dr. Kalanya, for really, blazing you are blazing you. and to know that uh i mean look look you, you what you've done you are meeting a need when i hear you say you developed and i listen to developing something that the hospitals don't have uh that unit there to treat because when you go to the hospital and you have a problem, you can pass out, you got some dental issues, uh, how are they going to treat it? And so yeah. by you integrating with the doctors, man, uh, you are saving lives because you can lose your life if Absolutely. because of things that are going on in your mouth. I, I remember your presentation from last mm -hmm. year when you talked about the more uh, you retain your teeth, Mm -hmm. <laughs> it can extend your life. Exactly, exactly. That's the truth. And so I don't know if there's any audience that have, uh, they are commending you uh, in terms of comments on what you've shared on tonight. Um, at this time, we'll look and see if there's any uh, comments and if there are, uh, you can address them. Uh, okay. Are there special practices for dentists when treating patients on chemotherapy? Let me make sure I got that correct. Are there special practices for dentists when treating patients? So in general, um, the, I, the key thing is making sure that the chemotherapy is not going to affect whatever treatment they're getting. If they're receiving fillings um, that are not 
cutting the gums, then there's usually not a lot that they need to do. But if they're doing more invasive procedures, then um, a communication with the uh, physician regarding the chemotherapeutic agent is important um, because certain medications that are given when you have cancer uh, treatment, um, you're also receiving what's called a bisphosphonate, um, which actually um, basically makes the bone um, hard to, it, it doesn't survive if it's been traumatized afterwards. And they call it dead bone disease um, are the layman terms. And so in, a, in those patients, if like you have breast cancer or um, multiple myeloma, I think it is, uh, we recommend that the doctors, and even osteoporosis for that matter, we recommend that the medical doctors first have them see a dentist so that anything that is invasive can be done prior to the administration of those um, things. Now with radiation, just to add on to it, um, radiation is a little different. Uh, ideally, you want those patients, again, to be seen by the dentist before you start radiation, because if you get radiation in the area, like if you have a cancer in the neck or the face, if um, any of that gets um, uh, affects the bone of the jaw, it only gets worse after time. And so then you have to get hyperbaric oxygen and things like that. So I think in general, preventative care is the key to everything oral. And if you are seeing, if you're going to need to get any kind of procedure, it is always a good idea to make sure that you see your dentist prior to getting some of those procedures because you can have complications. Even with being pregnant, you should see your dentist before you get pregnant or at least in your second trimester because a lot of times your oral health is not up to par and you can have infections that cannot be treated except for in an, an emergency setting. So um, I think hopefully that answers your question. I think so. Uh, you are bringing back to my remembrance um, when I was pregnant with either was after or before um, I ended up later seeing a specialist because mm -hmm. my oral mouth um, foods that were hot or spicy or cold, something changed in my mm -hmm. uh, mouth and they told me, they gave me a prescription that I had to gargle. I can't remember the right. name of the condition that was diagnosed, but right. uh, uh, but that happened to me. I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't affect me now, but I remember seeing this for uh, several months mm -hmm. that something changed. And there's a question uh, that someone is asking. I've read where certain teeth are connected to certain organs like the kidney, would pulling those teeth have an effect on organs? Now, that is a really good question. Now, Dr. I mean, um, Evangelist alluded to what I uh, presented to what presented last year regarding how many teeth you retain. Now, I will first do a disclaimer. I've extracted okay. some of my mother's teeth, so it's not, you know, it's not the only thing that affects your health, but if you can retain your teeth, that is always the best, um, I would say in, in general. And so if a tooth is not considered hopeless by a general dentist that they cannot um, repair it, um, then yes, it's better to have it out than to get an infection. Um, now with uh, 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 kidney disease, it depends on if you're getting um, um dialysis, in which case there are certain days that you can get uh, uh, invasive uh, treatment. And um, those are the alternating days of your um, of your dialysis. But in general, um, there's no specific organ that uh, is stated that um, that you that uh, is negatively affected by taking out teeth. And it depends on how many teeth. If it's a wisdom tooth, that's not a big deal. If you're only taking out um, four teeth for braces, that's not a big deal. It's when you get down to where you lose all of your molars and you're only eating, you barely have your uh, front, you know, some of them barely have any of your front teeth, then your diet changes. And that is the key thing mm -hmm. for most of the diseases is your diet changes because you can't eat those um, uh, um, vegetables. And uh, um, everything you eat has got is high, high calorie and um, high uh, carbohydrates. 
And so uh, that is the main main issue. But I don't think there's any specific organ that is negatively affected um, by uh, removing those teeth. But I, I, like I said, if you can save them, even if it uh, needs root canal treatment, um, I would invest in that because it is so much easier than to uh, have to have dentures and partials. Because if you get, especially dentures um, and, and your lower teeth, those dentures never feel the same after mm. 10 years because you lo lose more bone. Now they can put dentures on top of implants to help retain bone. And that's better than nothing. And that's really the standard of care, even though uh, insurances don't cover that. And some of the, those are some of the things that I also am kind of working on how uh, certain diseases in the oral cavity are covered by medical insurance so that we can ensure that patients can get elective, what they consider elective periodontal surgery, which it really isn't because it's a disease. So it should be able to be treatable just like if you had uh, skin cancer, they would treat it, they wouldn't say it was elective. And so I think, you know, they, you know, if people realize that, then uh, we would have better health overall and the outcomes, including hospitalizations and um, how our healthcare system is, um, you know, has been assaulted by COVID. Um, all those things have had a negative impact on um, on our economy. And if we would just think ahead and try to advocate saving um, as many teeth as possible, then, you know, the burden on the healthcare system would definitely improve. I know I gave you way more than was asked. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, our audience have enjoyed your presentation of information, and it has been just extremely helpful I mean, extremely. And I want to commend you for the work that you're doing, uh, Dr. Calhoun. Just what a blessing, what a blessing you are. And you even have the time to train and coach uh, on the weekend in praise and worship. Uh, all I can say is that thy God seeth thee. And mm -hmm. thank you for what you're doing. Uh, and I just trust that those that are watching, um, please share this video with others that, especially as they are aspiring, just mm -hmm. in their early, um, pay attention to young people and uh, their experiences going to the dentist and going to various uh, events can begin that journey. And it sounded like because of your experiences and the journey you inspired you way early to consider yeah. the field of dentistry. Uh, and thank you for sharing those amazing stories. And uh, we've learned more about Dr. Ida Cray and the legacy that she uh, left her imprint on this world. Uh, yeah. if, if you have any lasting word, and we want to commend you. I sat and saw the uh, celebration via the uh, Zoom, uh, mm -hmm. you being awarded. And I understand there is a student award as well. Yes, uh, and a so staff. Would you mention that? So any young people that may come across this video understand that they're at University of Michigan, would you speak to that as well? Yes, definitely. Um, one of the things I found when I started uh, at U of M is they always had a commitment to diversity. And even when um, um, the affirmative action was uh, removed, we still have found a way to have a commitment to diversity. So I would always recommend, plus U of M is the um, has stayed in the top five, even I think the top two for y decades, as far as uh, quality of dental schools. And um, their commitment to diversity has uh, spread to where the students are mentoring one another. They have this big brother, big sister uh, program and also um, um, Profiles for Success, which is a pre-dental, pre-medical program. And you can find that on their website. Um, and I actually was a mentor for one of those where we taught classes with Kaplan to prepare students for the entrance exam, as well as giving them opportunity to practice on mannequins and things like that. So they got a chance to see how a crown was made and how to you know, put a filling in a tooth just to, to spark the interest. And most of the people that, um, that go through that program, even if they're not interested in dentistry, 
end up getting in the, the healthcare field that they're interested in. So um, I, I think, and I, unfortunately, I don't know the student's name that received that award, but that student has um, been a leader as well as a staff member um, um, that received the award this year, have been leaders in ensuring that um, pay, people and staff uh, I'm sorry, students and staff feel like they're part of this. And I love the fact that they included staff. That was later ad for um, the university uh, because staff is so important. The ancillary people that work with us, my dental assistants and I get along so well because we actually work as a team. I'm not their boss per se. They respect my position, but we work as a team. And because of that, they have buy-in. And that's why I said the staff, um, being included in this is so important because a lot of times those are the people that the students and the residents go and talk to when they're struggling. My, my um, program coordinator, who ended up being my secretary after I uh, graduated, she was my sounding board and she was the one that told me how to get through things in the in, in, wow. in residency. And she, she was one of those people that advocated that they selected me Wow, and I I still think that she probably was the one that sent the letter, uh, saying that they wouldn't take any women because that's kind of why I got in. That's why I said, Lord, hey, whatever, what any way you bless me, I will be satisfied. Wow. No problem. So, um, I hope that I spoke to that in a little bit more with uh, just encouraging yes. even staff. Yes, and so we're going to um, anyone that may want to follow up with any questions or concern certainly feel free to go to uh, Dr. Calhoun's website and uh, reach out to her um, through her website. The information is on this screen. And I want to hey, encourage, you? yes. I was gonna say, and um, in addition, if you would like for me to come speak at your hospital or at your school, um, please feel free to reach out at that address. But also on the website, on the website, it says specifically if you want consultation for a medical center versus um, uh, uh, okay. having someone come speak and it, either me or one of my colleagues can speak to the audience that you uh, uh, have a desire for. Sorry, thank you. Oh, no problem, no problem. Well, we're gonna close uh, at this time and uh, certainly why don't you have a word of prayer for our, our viewing audience, if you don't mind. Oh, no problem. Lord, we thank you uh, for this time of caring and sharing. And I'm praying that each person that is uh, on the receiving end of this information is uh, better informed and that uh, they uh, have an inspiration that they can uh, make uh, improvements or changes in their life, even in, in, in whatever season they're in, like I've been able to experience. And also I'm praying uh, for each of them as they touch others' lives, young yes. people around them, that they realize that they can have a positive impact no matter what their position is, because they can disseminate this information um, for to, to other people, whether it's yes. um, family or friends uh, or children or grandchildren or the ones that are teaching schools. And so I just pray that we realize um, what kind of blessings we have when we have women trailblazers yes. in, the, in the body of Christ who can um, help us have influence because it ultimately your goal for us is that we would um, let our light shine before men so that they would see our good works and glorify you. Yes. All these blessings in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you uh, for sharing tonight and you will receive our beautiful reward as a way of saying congratulations and memory uh, this time that we shared. Uh, we will definitely reach out to you to get that contact information, where to send that to. Uh, let me end the broadcast and if you could stay on for just a, a few minutes.